to the common law. My name is attorney Edward Berkman. I am a real estate and a state planning attorney. I work out of Beverly, Massachusetts. I work for a law firm called DeRogers and Tierney. We're actually in the Cumming Center. I would like to thank everybody who tuned in to the first episode of The Common Law last month. Uh, we had over 60 YouTube views in our first week. Fantastic. I'd like to thank everybody who uh, watched last, last week. It was great. And, uh, you know, don't be afraid to leave a comment on YouTube. Uh, tell us how we're doing. Any suggestions for a show idea, even if, or, you know, you just want to ask me a question. Um, if you do want to ask me a legal question, uh, the best place to do that, that's going to be at my email address. That's eberkman at dtattorneys.com. It'll be right here below on the screen uh, in front of me. Now, as we d discuss this on every show, uh, we just have to give a little disclaimer here. Although I am an attorney, I am not your attorney. So the things and the topics that we discussed here today, this is just merely a conversation discussing legal topics, trying to just sort of broaden everybody's horizons on certain areas of the law. None of this is cons none of this should be considered legal advice. And if you do have a legal question, please reach out to your attorney. Uh, again, you can email me if you'd like and we can have a private conversation on your specific issue. If something sounds very similar, I don't care if it sounds exactly the same as what your current legal situation is, this is not legal advice. Please do not consider me your attorney unless you, of course, reach out to me. That being said, if you do have any questions or you'd like to come meet me in person on Monday, May 1st at 5.30 p.m., I'm going to be hosting a estate planning seminar where we're going to go over the importance of estate planning and discuss what each of these estate planning documents do and how you can best protect your assets and your legacy. Again, that's going to be Monday, May 1st at 5.30 p.m. That's going to be in the conference room in the Cumming Center in Beverly, the Building 100. It's going to be on the second floor. Again, if you have any questions regarding the seminar, please email me. I can uh, send you back directions on how exactly to get there. Moving on, uh, I'd like to start a recurring segment for the common law, and that is going to be a little bit of a market watch. So right now, the Federal Reserve rate is at 4.75%. Now, what does that mean? That's what the government borrows money at, basically, or large institutions will borrow money from each other at, at that rate. What that means for like common people, um, if you were looking at a 30 year fixed mortgage rate, those interest rates are probably going to be somewhere in the 7%. Um, now, those are anticipated to go up. So I wouldn't say now is a great time to refinance or take out a loan. But if you're going to need to, it might not be a bad idea to start thinking about that now. As a real estate attorney, I do have uh, plenty of mortgage officers and lending institutions that can help you. So again, reach out to the, my email address below and we can get you in touch with somebody that can help you. Now I'd like to introduce everybody to my guest. His name is Daniel Jenkins. He is a local police officer. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ed. It's a pleasure to have you, my friend. Now, as a local police officer, we're going to talk about a couple of things, mainly, you know, how to become a police officer and sort of like what the day to day is on the job. So, Dan, why don't you take a minute or so and just tell us about yourself? So um, I've been a police officer for 10 years. Um, I love the job and I've been local. I, I'm an area police officer in this area. Um, and I highly recommend anyone who any of you, you viewers who are interested in becoming a police officer to do so. Uh, it's a very rewarding career. Now, did you go to college? Yes, I did. What college did you attend? Salem State College. And you achieved a bachelor's degree? Yes. So the funny thing is I actually got a bachelor's degree in English. Oh. And right now I'm currently working on my um, criminal justice degree in hopes of eventually getting my master's. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, do you need a college degree to be a police officer? You don't. However, I highly recommend it. Um, you can... You can become a police officer with no degree. However, the more education you have, the better. Oh, fantastic. Um, 
I was once told by a very well-respected chief to um, get as much education as you can because it can never be taken away from you. Now, how do you like now studying criminal justice, being already having all this experience in that profession? Do you find like the classes rewarding or do you feel like you're just sort of, you know, walking through things? It's actually uh, quite rewarding. And to be honest, I feel like I have a lot of experience I can contribute to the class. So um, I, I don't take in-person classes. They're all remote. Mm. However, um, I do feel like I have an advantage. I mean, if I had taken it when I was 18, 19 years old, it'd be a little bit different because I just don't have that experience under my belt. So I guess it's really good that the students that you're sharing the class with, they can kind of use you as a resource. Maybe, you know, I know sometimes when I went to law school, it was very academic and it wasn't very practical. Mm -hmm. So it seems like you're giving a practical sense to your co-students, which just sounds fantastic. You're probably a huge resource. Well, when we do our discussions, I like to, you know, add a little bit of my own experience to it. Um, however, no one's ever really like reached out to me, but if anyone did, by all means, I would. Okay. Well, viewers, here you go. I mean, if by all means, if you'd like to uh, ask Dan a question, uh, you can email me and I'll send it back off to him. Now, Dan, um, are there any other sort of requirements for becoming a police officer? Well, the police academy is one. Um, a lot of departments will hire you without the academy and then send you. However, there's also people who self-sponsor, which you go to the academy on your own before getting employed. So um, why would somebody go to the academy? Like, so I could just go to the police academy right now? I don't need a... You would I need to get just, uh, sponsored by a... You'd, oh, okay. A chief would have to sponsor you. However, okay. um, you don't... Yeah, you don't need to have it. The reason people would would get the academy first is because it, it's much easier to get um, okay to get employed. So it makes sense. It's like you get your experience from the academy and then they can, um, you know, employ you from there. So there's probably, is there just less training or are you trained? Oh, it's you know, the same. Oh, same amount of training? Uh, as a uh, self-sponsor versus a yeah. regular sponsor. Yeah, it's the, it's the okay. same exact training. It's just, um, it depends on, you know, how are you employed at the time or are you not employed at the time? Oh, okay. But, um, yeah, the academy was uh, twenty. So, Mass Academy is twenty-two weeks. It's um, it's a there's a whole list of subjects, but the big ones are constitutional law, criminal law. There's obviously like physical fitness, and then uh, def defensive tactics, and you also have um, you know ethics and integrity are a huge part of it. Okay. Um, De-escalation training. Um, there's first responder uh, medical training, which is like the level below an EMT. And then um, there's a whole litany litany of other classes that you can that well courses or subjects that you, uh, for example, um, drug recognition. Uh, there's a okay. day on drug recognition. There's also a day on um, like or we do about a week of like domestic violence. Okay. Training, so. Now, how practical is the training? Are you actually like role playing? It's like for example, domestic violence. Is it almost like a play where you have like like someone's cast as the husband, someone's cast as the wife, and you're like going through a scene, or is it more like this is what you're supposed to do in this situation, and it's like blocked out? It's more of like classroom education. Okay. However, uh, there is some role playing. I remember doing some of that in the classroom where we would kind of do different scenarios. However, applied patrol procedures, which is at the end, is where they simulate a lot of these scenarios with like um, volunteers who are actors. Uh -huh. And you basically have to deal with situations as, as if they were on the job. Okay. And then you get you get graded on how you uh, handle it. Oh, I see. Very interesting. Yep. So, all right, so you go to college. You get an English degree. You then become a police officer. You go to the academy. Yep. What is, like, the first day on the job like? The first day is usually you have field training. Um, and it varies. It's some places it's a certain amount of time or a certain amount of hours. So what happened with me was I was a reserve officer first. And I had gone to the Reserve Academy 10 years ago. And then once I graduated that, I, I went through my field training as a reserve officer. And then I went through the full-time academy when I got promoted to full-time. And eventually, um, when I, when it, so when I graduated the academy, I went right into working. Gotcha. However, for a lot of municipalities bigger towns and cities you once you complete the academy you go right into field training 
Okay. And that's where you're, you're riding along with a field training officer and you're, you're obviously you're going to the calls and you're handling the situations. And um, Now, you mentioned you were, before you went to the academy, you went, you were considered a reserve officer? That's correct. What exactly is that? So reserve officers, it's kind of being um, phased out with post. Okay. However, um, a reserve officer is a police officer who has less, they, they have a reserve academy or it's like, a fraction well it used to be like a fraction of the full-time academy they've lengthened it now mm-hmm. or at least it was lengthened and now it's um it's kind of being done away with for strictly the full-time academy but that was for me it was probably half the hours of the full-time academy maybe if that okay so, so you're trained partially as a reserve officer yep and you wear a uniform yep and you go on patrol like you're in the police car by yourself yep Okay, so you're just, and you, so I imagine you're carrying a gun and a badge, and you're just patrolling and keeping the streets safe and enforcing the law. As a reserve as officer, a reserve. yes. Um, it, things have changed uh, since um, since we went to a, a post system. Mm-hmm. So now um, reserve officers have to go through a bridge academy, and it basically okay. gets them more up to speed with the equivalency of training that the full time academy uh, would have left you at. So okay. Now, is that a paid position of reserve officer? Yes, it is. Oh, wow. Um, damn, that's impressive. I, that's, you learn something new every day, folks. I didn't, I didn't know about that either. Yeah, I did that for like five years. Wow. Or four years. But. Wow, very interesting. So moving on from the training aspect. So what is the – and now, again, we're – you know, Dan's a local police officer, folks. So he's in one of the surrounding communities. All these communities around here are very suburban. Um, you know, Newburyport obviously is a city, but I mean, I don't I can't imagine there's a lot of violent crime happening in you know this general North Shore Cape Ann area. Um, so what is it like a average day on patrol like? Like, um, I mean, it it depends. Uh, it can be really slow or it can be really busy um i've Mm -hmm. seen both there have been times where it's go 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 and you're you know going to a lot of calls and there's other times where it's really slow you know you 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 go out and you do some traffic enforcement or Mm -hmm. you just patrol if you're on night shift a lot of times you um the emphasis is like patrolling making kind of keeping a presence in like some of the smaller neighborhoods okay um but like the um some of the residential areas. So is it more like community policing where you're just trying to become like a resource for members of the community and just sort of be like, Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Community policing is huge. It's Mm -hmm. anywhere, but especially, um, the smaller towns, we do a lot of that for folks who don't know at home. What is, could you just explain a little bit about what is community policing? Uh, community policing is basically making, it's it's become being as a police officer being more involved in the community. Okay. Um, coffee with a cop is a perfect example. Okay. Um, a lot of communities will do a coffee with a cop. In other words, they they'll you know whatever the local cafe is, um, they'll s- kind of set up shop in there, and anyone who wants to come in and sit down with the police and talk about anything, um, mo- just about every town does it. Okay. That's a perfect example. So if if a police officer was Superman. Community policing is like getting the cat out of the tree. Yes. Okay. Yep. So it's like every day you can't fight Lex Luthor. Exactly. Some days you need to go get the cat out of the tree. Exactly. But it's also, it's a very valuable service too. Okay. Because it allows people to get to know the police officers better. It's, you're not just kind of like a, it's not just a car they see. It's a, it's mm-hmm. a face. And Do you feel people are more apprehensive of approaching you? Like maybe fearful to coming to a police officer? Or do you feel like people in this sort of general community policing are more interested in, like, developing a relationship with you and being friendly and uh, things like that? I would say a lot more people um, are friendly. Okay. Um, obviously, there are people who are, are, are fearful. And um, community policing tries to kind of um, assure people not to be afraid of yeah. police officers. I mean, it happens to everybody. I mean, it happens to me. You're driving. I'm speeding. I get pulled over. My heart starts pumping. I'm start getting nervous. Oh yeah, I'm I've been like, there. Oh man, like I came. I'm gonna get a ticket. Oh my god, the cops behind me. <laughs> I, I I was such I was such a bad driver. I was speeding all over the place. But okay, so it is better to just don't necessarily be 
afraid of police officers they're ultimately here trying to help you yeah no you should never you shouldn't be afraid of the police okay fantastic exactly now when you're not on patrol and you have to go to court what is sort of your role within the courthouse um well we testify as witnesses um whether it be uh you know whatever the offense was Mm -hmm. if, if it goes to trial or or if it's a um a motion to suppress we have we have to go testify okay basically just um you get cross-examined on the stand so if you were to arrest somebody you would then go to court and be a witness basically saying like i witnessed them commit this crime correct if it doesn't you know plea out if mm-hmm. the person doesn't um agree to a, a plea agreement okay but yeah that's essentially what so with, are you involved with plea agreements at all or is that just purely the lawyers dealing with i'm it? not that's between the court okay. and the attorney do you develop relationships with the attorneys in your case, or are you mainly just there uh, as like a separate entity? We we have relationships with the you know the uh, the ADAs. Okay. Um, the defense attorneys. I mean, some of them you might uh, you might have frequently, and um, I do talk to them um, sometimes. Yeah. So just just seeing friend the same friendly faces every day every time you're in there. Yeah, I, I I'm not in court that often, mm-hmm. but. Um, I have done a fair amount of okay. testifying. What is your opinion of uh, of lawyers in general? Lawyers, I think it's a it's a very um, it's a very necessary profession, and mm. I think that um, all the power to you if you can yeah. get through law school. It sounds very difficult, but you're to pass like, the bar. it's sort of your one hand of a bigger you know piece. I don't know how we want to explain yeah, this. Yeah, that's... But like you're, it's like you work hand-in-hand hand with the police officers. You're enforcing the crimes, and then it's given to the lawyers and the justice system to sort of, you know, prosecute yep. and make sure that those laws are really enforced. I mean, it's not your job... Now, correct me if I'm wrong. It's not your job to sort of determine guilty or innocent. You are just simply taking somebody's liberty away briefly and allowing the court to make a, you know the determination yep. based off of you know our rights under the constitution you know you get you know a, the right to see a judge right to have a trial by jury if, if that's what you choose exactly it's all part of the justice system yeah. and we're a part of it as are you, you judges everything do you feel um sort of prideful in knowing that you're you have this role in this sort of larger community and like you're a, probably the first and you know often probably sometimes the biggest piece of that sort of justice system like if someone commits a crime or if someone is accused of committing a crime and arrested it's like the police officer is the sometimes that person's first entry into that justice system it is yep exactly so, i have a, i mean like i was saying it's a very rewarding career and um we are very you know we're a very important piece as are you Hmm. As an attorney, so. I don't I don't practice criminal law. Exactly, but, but if I, you appreciate did, yeah. that, I appreciate I <laughs> appreciate that all the same. Alrighty, so let's get into some of the roles you have um, now. One of the big pieces of law enforcement, law enforcement, I believe, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is just the use of discretion. So, could you explain to our audience here today what exactly is discretion? It's the ability to make decisions. Um, not every situation is going to have the same outcome. Um, police officers are are trusted to make you you know to use discretion. A perfect example would be uh, motor vehicle infractions. If uh, I stop a speeder, I'm not I don't automatically have to give them a ticket. I can give them a verbal warning or mm-hmm. a written warning, and it applies to other. Um, other laws, other violations. So you, so basically, discretion is a way of saying you can't arrest everybody, um, and you can't arrest every crime that you see committed. So you kind of you take so you take the witnessing of a crime yep. or the reporting of a crime, and you sort of do you look at the whole matter, like the big picture of it, and try to determine the best what is the best case, you know, of action for not only you but for them. And the whole situation, everybody involved. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of moving parts. Um, never, or I shouldn't say never, but very rarely are situations the same. There's okay. so many variables. There's so there's so many details that not everything has just a a clear cut 
resolution or clear cut um, ending. It, it's, okay. it, it varies. So, so just yeah, so some crimes are summonsable. Okay. And some are arrestable, and it varies. Some you can you can make that choice if it's going to end in an arrest or a summons. Okay. So let's let's back up a little bit back to the, like the when you mentioned the patrol. Mm-hmm. So if you are you know trying to you will witness somebody speeding. And let's just say two cars are speeding down the road at the same time. Mm-hmm. Are you using your is the use of discretion used when you decide which car to pull over? Um, Are you trying you're not trying to punish one person or the other You're just basically Just trying to enforce the crimes that you can enforce or yeah in terms of like if there were two vehicles speeding Yeah, I mean if you're you can stop two vehicles at once. Okay Um, It is kind of difficult, but it's I've seen people do it Um, However, yeah, it's it depends on so many factors the speed the location does the person have a um, a really bad driving record or do they have a very clean driving record? You got to take all these things into account before making that determination. So you would basically, you know, you pull somebody over, you ask for the license and the registration, you run their information and you're making, you're doing your, essentially kind of doing your homework. Yeah. You're doing your research on this person in the very limited amount of time you have available to you. And you're making a determination on how best to proceed and that is basically how you would use discretion. Yep. Yeah. That's a you know I was thinking about discretion, and that's a perfect example. Is just the 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 I don't want to say like everyday car stop because all of them are different, but in a way it's you mm-hmm. know you make a lot of motor vehicle stops, and you get to make the decision whether or not you're going to um, you know do a, a written a verbal warning, written warning, or um, issue a citation. And that makes do you feel like having that freedom of discretion? Do you feel like that makes the job of a police officer easier, more difficult? It makes it much easier. Okay. It, um, I think there are, you know, there are some some uh, laws where it's kind of a, a shall arrest situation, mm-hmm. um, arrest warrants, for example. But being able to make it that decision, I mean, that's that's why um, that's what I find very rewarding about the career is you're trusted. To make those decisions now what if you get i know this has probably been the biggest excuse when you pull somebody over for speeding you should pull somebody over for speeding and they're like why stop me you could have stopped eight other people why are you singling me out what's your sort of response to that sort of excuse my response is i'm i'm out here conducting traffic enforcement and i observed you make an infraction um can only stop you know so many cars in the course of a shift yeah but it's um it is what it is it's it's just you committed a violation and here we are fantastic so what other aspects of the police of your regular shift um do you need to do are are you filing like reports paperwork or is it just sort of all on on the road or you know patrolling the streets um I mean, we do quite a few reports. Um, we also do, especially on nights, you do like building checks, the, some of the public buildings. We might, the businesses, um, you, you know, drive by and just um, um, call in the check, make sure, you know, check and see if the doors are locked. And um, you call them either building checks or area checks. Um, that's another big part of it but yeah reports any any kind of um incident that's reported we 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 do a report and um also there's a lot of little things that we do too like a perfect example is um disabled motor vehicles we roll up on a lot a lot of times you roll up on a car that's broken down flat tire in which case you do it do what you can to help out the motorist whether it be assisting them with changing a tire okay. or calling a tow truck or even um giving them a ride home Wow. So. I mean, I imagine most people just like you there, making sure that like you're keeping them safe, mm. you know, from yeah. other other cars, you know, hitting yeah. them. And th- that probably brings us to what uh, our next topic is, the sort of the danger of the job. Um, you put you put your life on the line. I, I thank you for your service oh, okay. for doing that. Um, it's got to be scary. Are you, are you ever scared? Like. Yeah, I mean, it's a dangerous job. Yeah. 
um, you're not, you know, you may not be facing life or, or death situations every day. However, mm -hmm. it's inherently a dangerous job. And you just, that's why you got to you got to take your training seriously. Um, but yeah, it's, it's dangerous. Um, but it's, it's very rewarding. Okay. So you, you, it doesn't sound like you lose any sleep over it. No, no, it, I, do, I don't. And you hear about some incidents that happen and it, it's, um, it's heartbreaking, but, um, but no, I just go out there and, and, you know, serve the community. Oh, great. So if there was a, a younger person and they were trying to become a police officer, what are some tips you could give them on, you know, how they could sort of break into the legal career if they're going to college? Uh, what are some of the classes they should be looking to take? Um, and just sort of what sort of is a good prep to become a police officer if you're looking to get into that field? I would... If someone was going to college and they were interested in becoming a police officer, um, criminal justice, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but I would also, I would also, I would, I would recommend talking to police officers too. Okay. Definitely, uh, you know, go to your local police station, ask to talk to somebody about uh, the career and get more information. Mm -hmm. um, it is. There are some downsides to being a police officer, such as the, the work schedule. Okay. Nights, weekends, holidays, overtime, sometimes unexpected overtime. But um, if you have a, uh, if you're, you have an interest in the job, I highly recommend talking to police officers about it. Um, like I said, criminal justice. Uh, things have changed a little bit in, in terms of, um, like, when I was getting on the job, it was extremely difficult. Okay. Uh, de a lot of departments weren't hiring uh, post recession. Their departments weren't hiring, and there was a very, very high interest in the job. And I feel like now that's definitely calmed down. There are still interest in the you know people are still interested in the job, but um, the the departments just aren't getting as many applicants. So gotcha. Any any police officer would be happy to talk to talk to you about the job and give you a lot of info my um my advice would be um get some education post um high school and then um there are other jobs in the meantime in the police profession that you can take that'll teach you more about the job a perfect example would be dispatching okay um i started out as a part-time dispatcher oh wow so i did that for two years and, and that is uh is it just is what it sounds like you're basically taking phone calls getting on the radios and you know yep. reporting crimes and having yeah, you, people you go take, to different calls you take the calls you're, you get trained in uh 9 um emergency medical dispatch so okay. you can deal with like medical uh emergencies that come over 9 and then um there's some on the job training and it kind of immerses you right into the it sounds like it, yeah. I into mean, the the just the everyday of the the police department. I mean, we were talking earlier about how a, the sort of a police officer is the first entryway most people have into like the justice system, but it sounds like with a dispatcher that actually might be the role where some people are getting introduced to the justice oh, yeah. system, and it probably isn't under great circumstances. It's probably under like heightened stress or you know witnessing something or dealing with heavy either danger or like uh some sort of a traumatic event it could it must be really important to know how to talk to people in those sort of states of mind yeah. oh yeah in order to get needed information i know if i'm panicking I, good luck getting any information out of me i'm just yelling and swearing yeah no that's uh, dispatchers are trained on how to um I don't want to say calm someone down, but to get mm -hmm. someone to give the pertinent information when they're at a heightened level of yeah. heightened emotional level, which is a lot of people calling nine one one. Such a good it's, skill to have. It's it's uh, it taught me a lot, and yeah. it made me learn how to multitask. Uh, now, Dan, we were talking earlier in the show about yeah, what it takes to become a police officer. Um, when I to become a lawyer, you have to go to law school. You also have to take the bar exam. Is there an exam that police officers need to take in order to get hired onto a force? Or department? Yeah, it depends. Um, there's the civil services exam. 
Okay, so, when is that? So um, a lot of communities in the state are civil service communities. In other words, if you want to become a police officer or a firefighter, you have to take um, either the police test or the fire test through civil service. Um, I've taken it a handful of times over my career. Um, it's lengthy, but it's it's not that difficult. You don't have to be a police officer to do well in it. In other what words. kind of questions are they asking on this exam? Um, a lot of like little scenario based questions, but nothing nothing crazy. Nothing you would have to go to the academy to know. Um, I don't actually remember any in particular because it's been a long time since I okay. did it. But so, do you does every department use this? Is like this used in just Massachusetts? Is it used in all states? Um, it, most states use it. I know New York has a civil service okay. exam. Um, New Hampshire has a thing called the Great Bay Test, which is similar to that, but it's um, it's a little bit shorter. And um, not every town in not not every town and city in Massachusetts is is part of the civil service. Okay. Um, so so you it, take the exam. And then you have a score on it. Is it a pass-fail? How does that lead into getting hired um, by a department? It's not a pass-fail. Um, however, it's it's the basic, you know, zero through 100. Mm -hmm. um, and it the, the grading has changed over the years. I remember when I first used to take it, it was like you had the 100s, the 99s, 98s, and then anything under a 98, you probably weren't going to get a call. Okay. Because it was a very... There was so much competition. So everybody taking the test is in competition with each other, trying the highest score. Obviously, it yeah. becomes the most, you know, and sought whatever, after candidates. Exactly. And and what you would um, what you would do is whatever city or town that you were had established a year of residency in prior to the exam, um, that's what list you'll end up on. However, okay. they had changed it so that you could actually choose from. Like th there's either three or four different uh, civil service communities, and you could put those on your list, so you could end up on their list. However, you wouldn't have established residency there. Do you need residency to become an officer? So, do you need to live in the city that you are working in? No. So, f with civil service, you would have to have a year of residency in that town okay. to be considered at least a resident on the exam list, and that would bump you ahead of the non-residents. Oh, I get what you're saying. So, okay. yeah. And then um, an example would be if I lived in a smaller town like Essex, for example, that's not on civil service, um, and I took the exam for Beverly, I wouldn't be on I – would, I would be on Beverly's list, but I wouldn't be a resident. So I'd be below the residence no matter what I got. Um, yeah, and it's, it's – um, the civil service exams every – usually every two years, and it's – not every state has it. Um, it's not like the bar exam, which is very universal. Okay. But, which actually, um, having taken the bar, how difficult is that? I heard oh, it's pretty hard. You're asking me, yeah, the bar. So the bar exam is uh, two days. Um, I took it before uh, they changed it. So they recently changed it a few years ago where now it's um, the UBE, the uniform bar exam. I took it before where it was basically just – um, I don't know how you would want to call it before the Massachusetts bar exam is probably what they called it. Um, it says, so it's two days. The first day you have two, three hour sessions, um, answering a hundred multiple choice questions in each session. And then day two is, um, just all day you're writing essays. Wow. Um, so, you know, anybody who's looking to take the bar exam, who's, you know, watching this, listening to this. I definitely, the first thing I'll tell anybody taking it is spend the money, stay at the hotel. If you're taking it in Boston, stay at the hotel. It's in the Weston Hotel. It's at the Boston Convention Center. I just like to eliminate all chances of traffic, weather, get rid of all those instances, you know, any sort of emergency. You're there, you wake up, and you it's a five-minute walk to where you take the exam, and, like, you're ready to go. There's, you don't have to worry about any outside factors outside the building. That, that's my one tip. The other tip I would give anybody taking the bar exam would be uh, answer all the questions. Um, but, you know, so don't leave any of them blank. Um, even if you don't know, just guess. Just put in, it's multiple choice, put in a letter, guess. Make sure you don't have 
Because if it's not there, it's wrong. So you might as well, you have 25% chance, you might as well take it. Um, and then also just it's the t- it's time management is the biggest enemy mm. of the bar exam. So just know how much time you have for each question and then just do your best. And at the end of the day, you don't go over that time limit because then you're shortchanging yourself for another question. Wow. But bar exam, that's completely different. I mean, that, yeah. we, we should have a whole episode on the bar exam you want it, coming soon. You won't have to... Uh if you take the civil service ex- civil service exam, you won't have to uh, book a hotel room. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. Good to know. All right. Well, Dan, thank you so much for uh, for joining us here at the Common Law. Um, we mentioned before your job is rather dangerous. Do you have an estate plan set up in case anything happens to you? Um, I do not. You no, know, you should probably should take care of that. Um, I do have a homestead. Okay, homestead. That's we talked about that a little bit in our last episode, folks. Um, that's just a good way to protect the equity you have in your home. Uh, it's you know that we can go into all the minutia on that um, again later, but basically it's a good thing. File a home. If you have a question on a homestead, email me. It's right here. We'll we'll talk about it. We'll take care of you. Um, I'll I'll put you on the right path. Now, uh, if you know if you don't have an estate plan, it's, it might be a good idea, Jenkins, if you wanted to come to my free uh, estate planning seminar. Uh, again, we talked about this in the beginning of the show. That's going to be Monday, May 1st. It's completely free. We're going to talk about all kinds of the documents that are included with an estate plan um, and the benefits on sort of estate planning in general. Um, it's absolutely free. It's at the Coming Center in Beverly. Again, that's Monday, May 1st at 5.30 p.m. Dan, again, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thanks for I'd like to me. thank the audience for uh, um, listening to our conversation. And uh, next week on The Common Law, we will be discussing um, another legal topic. Tune in next time. Bye, folks. Thank you. This has been The Common Law, hosted by me, Attorney Edward Berkman. This podcast has been written, produced, and edited by myself, attorney Edward Berkman. The production coordinator of this podcast is Sarah Blackstone. The Common Law has been produced with the training and resources provided by WJOP 96.3 FM Joppa Radio. Thank you.